Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for your word, for your son that comes, for the life that you bring. We pray, Lord, that these words would honor you and help us to be the people you have called us to be. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. A long time ago, there was a young preacher who went to his very first church, and, and as oftentimes happens, he got up to preach, and he looked out at the crowd, and he said, all right, and I'm kind of at that spot. It's good to be here this morning. You know, no ice, no cancellation, you know, all of those things are good. The same preacher, when he started, he preached this wonderful sermon at the beginning of his ministry, and the people left that day. They shook the preacher's hand and said, that was a great sermon, preacher. Can't wait to hear it again. And so the next week, they all came back, and he preached the same exact sermon. <laughs> and the elders started to get worried. Who are the elders here today? You should start to worry right now. <laughs> Because, you know, they got together and they said, well, maybe he just had a bad week and didn't have time to write a new sermon. So he gave the same one as last time, and it was still pretty good. They said, but we're going to have to watch this preacher. <laughs> and sure enough, the third week, he preached the same sermon. And you know what that caused? That caused a meeting. <laughs> of the elders. <laughs> One of the elders has already promised that that wouldn't happen here. Can't wait to see what happens next week. <laughs> and sure enough, they have a meeting. And they look at him and they said, well, you know, the first week it was pretty good, and the second week it wasn't even all that bad, but the third week in a row, you better preach something different next week. And he looked at them in just about the calmest, most holy face that he could come up with. And he says, well, when y'all do the things that I told you to do in the first sermon, we'll move on. Now the good news is I'm, I've already written next week's sermon. And it's not this one. But I will tell you that I preach a pretty simple Jesus. And him crucified and resurrected. And that's the story we have. That's the faith we profess. That's the message for the world we live in. Now, I can hear it already, but preacher, you just don't know where we live. I say, I do know where some of you live. You all live somewhere around Junction City, Oregon, and I can find you. But you're right. We live in a complicated world. We live in a world that seems so difficult and so harsh and sometimes so hateful. We live in a world that sometimes we wake up in the morning and say, Oh God, do I have to go out there? How many of you have ever said something like that? How many of you, in fact, just rolled over and went back to sleep that day? Some of you are giggling, and that means that I was right. I want to tell you about today the church together. I am a great fan of the symphony. I have a friend who is the first chair violin player for the Portland Symphony. I went to high school with him. I've been to symphony performances all over the country. 
I have been to see and hear the symphony. I've even played in a few symphonies when I was much younger. But the reality is most symphonies don't call for a tuba player. Beethoven didn't ever use a single tuba player. I know, it's very sad. <laughs> But I love the symphony because I think it's a great description of the church. Of who we're called to be as the church. Have you ever noticed that one good violin player is really great? I mean, if, if I have the ability to bring Juan down to play for it, she'll go, oh my gosh, that was wonderful, it was terrific, can he come again? Is he that good? But, one violin player can't play a whole symphony. One violin player can look at Beethoven's Fifth Symphony and go, well, this is my part. And most of the time, if you're the first violin player, you'll recognize what they're playing. But there will be places where if he's playing the first violin part in the fifth, Beethoven's Fifth, you will go, what in the world is he doing? This is not in that song, and it is. But when you add the rest of the violins, and then when you add the cellos and the basses and the violas, when you add those other pieces, the music gets deeper and thicker and it expands and fills the whole hall. And people leave the symphony going. I'm one of those people that if I'm attending Beethoven's Fifth Symphony and any symphony, I think I'm in church. Just so you know. <clears throat> because it is God at work. Because, you know, you ever hear two violins play two notes together? It's not pretty. But if you have a third note, or a fourth note, or a fifth note, it begins to be harmonious. And we in the church are called to be like a symphony. We are called to follow the director, and the director is Jesus. It's Jesus that's telling us what to do and where to go and how to do it. Sometimes we in the church just make it harder than what it has to be. Have you ever noticed that sometimes life is harder than it needs to be, even in the church? So I'm, I'm going to very quickly, I hope, tell you how we're going to move forward from today. And it's as simple as, repeat after me, two, two, two three, three, four. Now you notice I didn't put a one in there because the one is always there and the one is always Jesus. And Jesus spends some time with his disciples Helping them understand what their calling is. And after all, who are we? We are the First Christian Church of Junction City. Disciples of Christ. So we need to do and follow what Jesus calls us to do and, and follow. And so I'm going to tell you that there are uh, things in our scripture reading. And the first one we're going to look at is way back at this Matthew 22. And if you notice, Jesus says... Verse 35, one of them says, what's the most greatest commandment in the law? What's the most important thing? You see, the, the, the Pharisee wanted to know what the one really most important thing was. So Jesus told him, and here's one of the answers that you need to understand. When we ask Jesus, when we ask Jesus, what is most important, he always, always, always will tell us. And he tells the disciples, he says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's first. That's first. So, love God. Say that. Love God. Love God. Number one, love God. And, and then he, he finishes, and I don't have the slide, but the next... The next piece says, and the second thing, just in case knowing the first thing isn't quite enough for you, the second thing is love others. 
or your neighbor. I, I sometimes will shorten it up. Love others. So the first thing we're called to do is love God and love others. That's two. But Jesus understood the human condition. Jesus understood that as people, we seem to want to make things more complicated than they have to be. And so he took us all the way to after the resurrection. Oh, my only I did have it up there. Uh-oh. <laughs> all right. So in Matthew 28, you're just going to have to trust me or look at the back of your bulletin, come the three things. Oh, by the way, there's a key word in the first one, and that key word is love. So if you're filling out the little thing, the outline in your bulletin, the key word is love. Love, love who? Love and love others. All right, so the second thing he does is he's got the disciples, and he brings them together after his resurrection, and they're going, oh, isn't this cool? And then Jesus says, well, let's see if you really think it's cool. Because, see, I think one of the things that Jesus does to all of his disciples, and that's all of us, is sometimes looks at them and say, well, let's just see how far we can stretch ourselves. And then he says, go into all the world and do three things. Make disciples, baptize people, and teach them to obey all that the Father has commanded, or all that I have told you. The key word, obviously, is the word go. Notice, he never says, stay in the church building and be comfortable. He never says, stay sitting in your pews because they're so comfortable. I don't know, I've sat in three different pews so far, and. Comfortable is not it. And I think that's on purpose, so you don't want to just stay. <laughs> he says, go make disciples. Go baptize people. I was so excited to see those pictures of, of the four that joined the church before Christmas and Tanner's baptism. I think somebody else got baptized too, right? Right here. Larry. 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 Yeah. So... I, and I hope you applauded and jumped up and down with joy and screamed hallelujah. And then we had people join that day. Because new life is new hope. And new life brings joy. So go and make disciples. And, and disciples are not just pew sitters. Just so you know. The fact that you're sitting in a pew doesn't make you a disciple. No more than having a car in your garage. No, you know how that goes. No, no, no more how often you sit in the garage, it doesn't make you a car. Something like that. <laughs> you, know, you get the quotes right sometimes. But you all get the picture, right? So go make disciples. And, and how do you make disciples? You do make disciples through... Uh, Bible study and worship and time together and, and being mentored by people who have been disciples and, and, and you baptize people well you got that down because I saw pictures but what do you have to do to baptize people you have to invite them in and they have to come to a decision that they want to follow Jesus which means we have to invite them to follow Jesus and that's always good and that's going to be important in our days ahead is First Christian Church of Junction City. We're going to invite people to come to know Jesus, to become disciples, and to change the world. Someday I'm going to tell you about the world. I think it's next week. So go, go, go. Make disciples, baptize, teach. Oh, that's one that we have to remember. We have to teach people things. And what do we need to teach people? We need to teach them about Jesus. We need to teach people about Jesus. We need to teach people about Jesus. Because if we're not teaching people about Jesus, 
We're not teaching people about anything that really matters. It's really true. But, you know, you know, people look at the people sitting next to you and go, yep, you're one. Go ahead, turn, turn that and say, yep, you're one. You are one. Sometimes we like to make it even harder than that. So, you know, not only can we do the two things, which are love, God, God and love, God and the three things go, make disciples, make disciples baptize, teach, teach, but sometimes there, sometimes you really just want somebody to tell us exactly what to do. And this is really the important part. And if you were here on December 8th, you, you actually heard me say this in a much longer sermon. There are four things that, as the church, we are supposed to do. And if we do things that aren't these four, then they're unnecessary and probably detrimental. There we go. And they, the church, in the book of Acts, if it says they, it's the church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. If we start doing things that aren't found in, in that, then we're off course. Now, what are all of those things? The apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayer. Well, how many of you know what prayer is? Okay. And you all think you know what breaking bread means because we, we, we do this thing at the communion table every week, but it's not just about the communion table. It's about worship overall. And fellowship, I know you all think you know what that is too because I always used to think that meant lunch. <laughs> Sometimes it includes lunch, but, but, but I've already seen this church at work caring and loving people and being the fellowship together. And it has to do with being the body of Christ together and to the apostles' teaching. In other words, that teaching about Jesus. God. But we're going to talk about God in terms of Jesus most of the time. So, there's two things. Love. Okay. Love. Love. God. Okay, we got to practice this. When I point out that means God, when I point out that means others. Love. I love others. Thank you. I'm trying. And go make disciples, baptize, teach. And then, number four, devote yourself. And what does the word devote mean? The word devote means to put your whole being into something. When you are devoted to your wife, when you are devoted to your husband, when you are devoted to your family, when you are devoted... Well, here's what I'm going to tell you. As Christians... Wives and husbands and families and churches are all wonderful, but ultimately our devotion is to be to Jesus. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And so we are called. We are called. Look at the people sitting next to you. Everybody turn your head. Look at somebody else. Because here's the real truth. It's not about you. It's about us. It's about Jesus. Now, as I was fine-tuning the sermon this week, because I had some extra time, you know, <laughs> I noticed something. And I noticed that if you followed the 2, 3, 4 method, it said, love go together. And then I really had a brainstorm. You can tell me, that hurts sometimes. <laughs> Any of you ever noticed that to have a brainstorm sometimes hurts? 
God was telling me something that's really important for this church to know and understand about this passage, these passages. Whoops. So I didn't get the slide yet. The really important thing is I beg you to remember it. The first Christian church, Junction City, Tory King, is devoting themselves to together go love. Did you hear that? We are called together to go. someone to say, do you believe? Or there may be somebody, I have to tell you, I have a friend named Paulina. She lives in San Antonio, Texas. We've been friends since she was 16 and I was much younger. She was so excited. She sent me a text, or a, a Facebook message. She says, she calls me Uncle David. Uncle David, do you know do you know I have friends in Salem? <laughs> I said, cool, are you going to come visit them? And she says, no, but I have news for you. They're moving to Junction City. <laughs> and they need a church. I know a place. Confession of faith and being baptized. We invite you to do to, to make that known to us by coming forward as we stand together and sing this last song. I know we are Christians by our love. Would you stand with me as we sing? Oh. 